Good evening, everyone. Thank you again for joining us for another one of the Military Aviation Museum's ongoing series of webinars. I'm Keegan Chetland, the director of the Military Aviation Museum. Um, tonight, we've got a really exciting presentation for you all. We're going to be taking a look at a piece of top secret local-ish history, if you consider uh, Elizabeth City to be to be local to us here in Virginia Beach. Um, our theme tonight is going to take us again to World War II. Uh, people know Elizabeth City nowadays as a fairly massive Coast Guard base. Uh, during World War II, it was a hub for a lot of naval patrol operations and uh, one top secret training program that trained over 300 uh, Soviet aviators to hunt Japanese and German submarines. Joining us this evening is Matt Chrissy. He's the critically acclaimed author of 16 books that stretch across multiple genres, many of which are true stories or based on true events. Um, he's a recognized international businessman as well and has been uh, lauded for his work in the advertising industry. So I personally really enjoyed the book when I had an opportunity to read it and learn first about Project Zebra. We're so pleased to have him with us this evening. He's joining us from his home in California. Matt, can you hear us? I am, I am alive and well. Well, uh, over to you. Tell us, tell us more about this incredible story. All right. First of all, everybody, thank you really very much for, for kind of listening in. And we'll try to make this both informative and, and interesting and have a little bit of fun along the as, as we go along the way. You know, we're, we live in very difficult times, as we all know. So anyway, let me give you a little, a little background on myself, first of all. This is about three or four slides just to thumbnail. Uh, I, I've done pretty much everything you can do in terms of the world of business, met some great people, you know, and all that kind of stuff, been featured in magazines and, and wound up in who's who. Uh, about 23 times I've been elected to who's who. So now my specialty is actually building world brands. So a number of brands that you either eat, drink, or seen um uh, are are things that i was involved in building either domestically internationally launching and so on so so and it's it's as diverse as my personality which is some people <laughs> call it a little unusual so anyway uh now you know I, I don't know how to tell jokes and do all those kind of you know george jessel uh you know things at the beginning of a of a program but I will tell you this, I have had a great life. I've made mistakes, we've had some ups and downs, but I met my wife when she was 17, I was 18. We had two kids and two miscarriages, we're married over 50 years. And along the way, I have gotten to meet some incredible people. Given, given that dad and mom you know, started out with zero, my mom was a telephone operator, my father was a butcher, these are just some of the people over here. That's me. And that's my wife, Marianne. But uh, along the way, these two people, his name is Charlie. That's Fanny. Fanny was my mother. She fell in love with this guy, Charles Mignanti. They stayed in love for about 60 years and never married. This was my father's first business partner who wound up to create the greatest scam in the history of America called the salad oil scam. So. So there's all kinds of people. This lovely lady down here, that charming all-American, she's actually from Britain. She's tried to commit suicide three times and so on and so forth. And this person in the middle, which is kind of these two people are the journey into Russia. This little kid here is the world's first female fighter pilot. Her name is Lilia Litvak. And I wound up writing a story about her which then led me to him, and that's Gregory Gagarin, who is the last living zebra, although Gregory passed a few months back over in, uh, um, in Maryland. And, uh, and this is one of my good friends. He, if he lived anywhere but Russia, he's had 66 international film awards. His name is Vladimir Alinikov, and you'll see how he comes into play later. So anyway, uh, just a, I've had a great time. So, so where we are now is my library uh, consists of, uh, as we said before, 16 books. We're top 3% of all Amazon authors, and you will see there are no cookie cutters. So 
this was that first book I was telling you about, uh, and so on and so forth. And you can, you know, there's going to be a little raffle later, and you can, you know, you can see. But tonight we're going to focus on Project Zebra, which uh, one of the review companies calls it the one of the last great untold stories of World War II. And before I start, you kind of need to know how the heck this came about. And that is because I think that might be give you a little perspective. I had written Call Sign White Lily in conjunction with a, muse a Russian museum curator and a Ukrainian English teacher. And I traveled over to all those places where the bombs are dropping in Ukraine. And so I have a different point of view about Eastern Ukraine than most people. But that then led to some awards that took me to the book called Seven Days in Russia. And it was along that path that Gregory Gagarin introduced himself to me and said, you know, I've got this story that's been kicking around for a long time and I've never known what to do with it, but just looking at your interest in this area, you know, it might be something. And so I kind of went, you know, I, I hear that all the time. Everybody tells me I've got one idea or I've got an idea for a book. So I, I was kind of nice. I said, fine, I'm down in Washington. I'll come out for a cup of coffee. Well, this house turned out to be a museum. He, as you'll see when we talk, he just pulled all this stuff together as part of the Project Zebra uh, uh, mission, not knowing exactly what he was going to do with it, but knew it was historical. And you'll find out a little bit more why in a second. So that's kind of what we're going to focus on tonight. And um, I mean, I, you know, I am not a historian, and, and this is going to be a story about humanity, but it is against a backdrop of history that you have to, most of you know some of it, you may not know some of this. I learned some of it along the way, but in roughly August of 39, um, Stalin and, and, and Hitler uh, decided on a non-aggression pact, now for different reasons at that point. The Germans, you know, Hitler was just figuring, hey, I'll, I'll lull Stalin to sleep until such time as I'll come in and take, oh, you know, get all the Russians and we'll use them for cheap labor. And Stalin at that point said, I don't have the military might that, you know, the Germans do. So maybe we can, you know, keep the whole thing at bay for a couple of years until we build up our military might. So there were straight different reasons. Well, uh, a little more than a year later, Hitler changed his mind. And he issued a thing called Directive 21. This is actually, now you're gonna wonder where some of these documents came from, just so you also know that quite accidentally and coincidentally, Project Zebra was finally declassified almost on January 1st, 2013. And, as I, and I was able to dig up some stuff that, um, you know, is kind of one of a kind, and I'll, I'll tell you more about that as we go. But this is the actual Directive 21, and that is Hitler's actual signature. And so what it basically says is, let's get all the boys together, my allies, and let's kill that mother. And so in June of 1941, Operation Barbarossa was launched. And, you know, growing up in America, as far as I knew, not being a historic, historic major, was that, you know, the Holocaust was the worst thing that ever happened in the world, and it is a terrible tragedy. But what what Hitler did was kind of amazing. He got he got a bunch of countries together. He got uh, everybody from Italy, Sweden, Finland, uh, and a couple of you know um, Romania, Croatia. They got all these countries together and formed this allied base. And they sent in, in a period of about 60 days, 5 million troops, 2,000 howitzers, 1,000 planes, and about 2,000 tanks. And they wiped out Russia. They knocked out 2 million people were dead. They pillaged over 1,700 dead. More, most importantly, one of his targets was to cripple the Air Force. So they just basically cripple the air forces and then cripple their ability to get anything to travel by rail. So that was their objective. And, and they did a pretty good job of that. So 
The other thing that was going on at the same time was that uh, the Germans had these incredible U-boats, as many of you know, and they had the unique ability, they were destroying anything that went through in the North Atlantic, war materials, supplies, replacements. And so the official number is somewhere upwards of 60% of everything that went through got wiped out. Now, down in the lower right hand side, this was the Russian seaplane air force. It was a single engine, single person seaplane. And they were trying to stop these things. So they weren't doing so well. So, so at that point, Stalin and, and Roosevelt start having conversations. So they first had conversations in, in 42, and then they met in person, very famous picture you all know, in, in Tehran, in Iran, in, in 43. And, and they, the two of them cooked up this idea that if we had this super plane that could roam the seas, that it wouldn't be such a bad thing to be part of the Soviet Air Force. And so, but it needed, you know, it basically was the PBI that's down at the museum, PBY that's down at the museum, but it needed a whole bunch of modifications. So, so Stalin put the only one of the few people he ever could trust his Prime Minister Molotov in charge of the project. And Roosevelt handpicked Patrick Bellinger, who was the Vice Admiral of the US Navy, as the two guys that would lead this project. And I'll tell you a little more about how Elizabeth City comes into this. So, so first I'm gonna tell you a little about the mission, then we'll tell you how Elizabeth City wound up in this. So it was basically a three-part mission. The first part was we agreed to build 185 of these huge planes and we were going to make some modifications, which I'll show a few in a, in a minute, uh, to make them state-of-the-art amphibious warplanes. Number two, we were then going to take those planes that we made in Philadelphia and bring them down to Elizabeth City, and we were going to train Russian airmen in America to fly those planes. And then the third thing that was going to happen, which it turned out with the help of the British, was to deliver those planes, and I'll show you the routes in a minute, both to the North Atlantic and the Pacific theaters, so they could fight both the Germans and the, uh, you know, and the Japanese over there. So that was the mission of Project Zebra. Now, as I said before, we there were very few places you could build anything this big. Okay, so the Navy Yard was picked as as a place that had the capability to build these things. And they called it a nomad. That was the name of the thing. So first thing is, it had a bunch of upgraded warplane specs. Okay, a lot more firepower, dual gun mach machine gun turrets, bigger, you know, multi uh, multi millimeter, you know, guns. They had huge wings full of depth charges, which exceeded what was done. They also it had been a very slow plane, as you know, and so they took out a whole bunch of stuff out of the inside to make it lighter, and they redesigned it completely for speed and maneuverability so the thing could actually stay airborne for 30 hours without refueling. Then we put in those days, the, the hot new bomb site was a thing called the Norden bomb site. So we we decked every one of these planes out with this state-of-the-art Nord bomb site. And the last thing is we put in a low-fly radar system so that they could fly 200, 250 feet off the ocean floor uh, so to make them extremely difficult to discover. Uh, now, another thing they did, which is they took the wings and they created a dual function hydraulic system that had never been done before. So the planes could take off and land either in the water or on land, depending on what you did with the flaps on the end. And by scripping out all kinds of goodies inside, they increased the cargo space dramatically. In fact, they made it so streamlined that you could put up to 185 troops back there 
And I'll show you one of the ways they use that. So unbelievable firepower, unusual performance and functionality. Now, okay, so here it is. And this is a drawing of one of the things and you'll see things like the depth charges and the, you know, this is one of the earlier diagrams and this stuff on the end is, goes up and down uh, at about uh, this level here so that it can, you know, it can land and take off as a, on dry land. And, and you can't really tell from this, but they, they stripped a lot of stuff out inside to make it really lean and, and, and trim. And this is what it looked like. And that was called the Nomad 5. In Philadelphia, <laughs> we not only had a sequestered place where we made them, we had a bunch of people that even painted the red stars on the planes for the Russians. So, so we did the whole shooting match for them. And now, just so you know, this is what the thing ultimately looked like. And remember, I showed you that picture earlier. This is this is what they started with. So you'd have to say this was a slight upgrade from where they were. Okay, so so Stalin was was a happy guy. There was a big hassle between Churchill and Stalin and and Roosevelt. That's for another time about where were the funds going to come from this. And Churchill didn't want his money usurped his foreign aid usurped by the Russians and blah, blah, blah. And that's a whole other story. But so now, okay, the plane is kind of in production and being made. So now they got to be trained. So the first thing is they decided that Stalin would fly 300 Soviet aces into America in, you know, the darkness of evening and they would fly in, in American planes. So there were some various connections made and, and these people were picked up. So these were the best people they had to fly at the time. The second thing on the Bellinger had to do on the American side is he had to get a, a group of knowledgeable naval training people together that knew something about seaplanes, electronics. They knew about you know, uh, about radar. They had to know a lot about the bomb sites. It was because this was kind of like a first time ever. And they had to also be able to train people. The third thing was that they knew they were going to have language problems because there was only one or two Russians that spoke English and it was poorly. It wasn't spoken well. And obviously, as you'll see something about Dewey, and, and there was tremendous cultural misunderstanding. So if we think we're at odds with the Russians today, it's no different than it was back in 1944. So you had all of that to deal with. Now, uh, now people say, well, why Elizabeth City? Well, there was some rational and then some emotional reasons. So first of all, the proximity to Philadelphia was great. So the planes could be produced and ferried down to Elizabeth City. Number two, Elizabeth City, because it was it was doing, um, it had blimps and, and that sort of thing for the Coast Guard, it had unique maintenance capabilities. Uh, at this point, one of the huge blimp facilities burned down, but they, I mean, this is the place you could stick one of these things if you needed to do maintenance on it. Um, next thing was you had, amphibious capability right there. So you could practice on dry land and, and as a seaplane. So it was all available to you right there. Uh, the other thing was it was easy access out to the Atlantic Ocean. So, you know, and that was important if you were trying to get this thing back on a track to get them, they had to go all the way back into the, you know, the war theaters. So, so that was important. So it was kind of like hidden, but but still had easy access out, probably right past the museum. <laughs> uh, and, and there was one other qualitative reason. Roosevelt went through Elizabeth City in for his, his third his third campaign, 
And he liked the city. He liked the people. He liked the patriotism of it. He thought it was a really great little patriotic American town. It was like it was like Norman Rockwell's Americana. So he never forgot that. And now, now, so now, now you got an idea of what the problem was that they were trying to fill with the plane. You have an idea of the situation um, in terms of the war. You have a little bit of a feeling for why Elizabeth City was picked and a little bit about the plane. Now we're going to talk about the people because all of that stuff doesn't matter if you don't have a unique group of people to make something happen in reality. So the American commander had some unique qualifications. He had he had been a Rheingold beer truck driver, and he eventually became a general manager of the Rhein, Rheingold Beer Company distribution division. <laughs> and his name was Stanley Chernak. <laughs> and he basically subscribed to the theory that all that mattered in life was results and he could care less about following the rules per se. And his attitude was, this is not gonna fit any of the guidelines that I've been taught anyway, so we'll make it up as we go. And one of the things he did, this is Stanley, and this is his wife, Edith, Stanley died at 93, about uh, six or seven, let me see, uh, no, it's 14, 15 years ago now. And Edith, and that's their son, Peter. They had two children. And this is their, their house in Nantucket. And you may notice he's in sort of a naval outfit. And the reason is right at the end of the air base in Elizabeth City, there was a consolidated uh, air uh, air manufacturing company, consolidated aircraft, and they made these little Volte two-seater training planes. And so Stanley would borrow one and go up and see his wife and kids on the weekend and take somebody with him. And there was a guy by the name of Joe Flickinger, who was a lifelong native of Elizabeth City, who became his teacher and pilot. So, <laughs> so that was one of the things that uh, Stanley used to do. And part of the reason I found out some of these things about Stanley is because I didn't, this is the part I didn't mention before. In my research, I eventually stumbled into Stanley's family and they lived up around Los Angeles. And it was just the daughter-in-law that was left. Everybody else was dead. And she said, I don't know how you found me, but you know, I've always wondered, we've got three brown boxes in the garage that say zebra 1941, 42, 40, whatever it was. She says, I had, I've never opened them and they're just sitting down there. And that was how we found an unbelievable treasure trove of stuff. So now, so that was Stanley. Uh, now, on the Soviet side, it was exactly as you would think. They put a guy in that was stiff as a board. He was strict and disciplined, and his name was Viktor Vasilievich. And and I probably butchered the names, but that's you know it's it's and so Viktor was a piece of work. I mean, he was like now he was picked, and there was some background which was. He, he believed in the Kool-Aid. This is kind of like the posters they had floating all around the Soviet Union about the time of his heyday in the early 40s. That, and basically the posters saying, this is the place to be. The Soviet Union is the place to be. Now, this was the actual, that was an actual store at the same time. So reality didn't quite match with, with what was being advertised, but you know, you you knew what you were told so that's so he bought the kool-aid the second thing is he had a very specific agenda and the first part was that he wanted to repair his own reputation he had gotten into some trouble in the in the military in the early days and it was kind of you know uh built a little reputation as a troublemaker and never quite went to reconciliation school or whatever they call those crazy things. But 
So this was his chance to kind of, you know, regain and score. The second was he wanted to project that there's nobody that's got more professionalism than him and that he is like the professional soldier and everybody attached to him becomes exactly that way. And of course, like many of the Soviets at the time, particularly given the complexity of language and, you know, and their belief that, you know, that, you know, we were not their friends, but this was sort of a, you know, he was very guarded and he remained suspicious of everything. So he was commander number one and that he was going to succeed at all costs. So there was no way he was ever going to get embarrassed. Now, he got to meet somebody that is really unusual to this story. I mentioned before about this guy, the last living American zebra. Well, I was not actually born in the United States. His name is Prince Grigory Gagarin. And his family was actually in you know, the czar's court over there. And so he somehow wound up coming to the United States when his father escaped during the Bolshevik time. And so he spoke, he was totally bilingual. He went to MIT, he was freaking brilliant. So he went to MIT and he knew everything there was at that time about about electronics and, you know, and, and so on. So the, and the other thing was, he was uniquely culturally aware so that he graduated from MIT, but it's actually a pretty famous family in Russia. So the soldiers knew his father had been a prince and he had very deep seated roots that go all the way back. If you, you know, you're not gonna obviously look at this chart in detail, but those roots go back centuries. So. So he was kind of this hybrid, and uh, I don't even know how the Navy exactly found him, but it was, what what happened was he said he was training to go to the Pacific Theater, and he had been all trained and all spiffed up with because of his electronic background, and the commanding officer came in one day and said, uh, you're, you're on a different mission, you're going down to Norfolk News, and they're going to pick you up with a bus, and Greg asked what, what it was that he was going to do. And the guy said, I don't know, after investing all the time in you, I'm just annoyed that you're leaving. And so that was, so what happens about 19, about October of 93, uh, 43, the Soviet airmen arrive in Elizabeth City. And if you'll notice, you'll see the giant planes with the stars on them. So hell, hell, the gang's all here. They're all trying to, you know, get to know each other and understand the ground rules. So that was kind of a big historic moment. And because it was such a big historic moment um, that I'm gonna show you something in a minute uh, about what they all decided to do. But the mission itself, they concluded there were gonna be three routes. The first route to deliver these planes was gonna be over the North Atlantic. And the reason they picked that is because it was this, the most direct. You leave Elizabeth City, you have water, bingo, you stop in Newfoundland, then you're over in ice, stop in Iceland, and you wind up in, in, uh, in Northern Russia. And so that was the logical idea. We're gonna go like that. Okay, well, now, as I started to say before, the, they had that all planned and they also knew, all these people knew that they were participating in something historic, that it had never happened before between America and Soviet Union or the Russians at that point. And none of them really thought it might, it might ever re-happen. So they went and they had professional pictures taken. So. This is the publicity, the zebra publicity picture. Now I'm going to show you the publicity picture that the Russians brought home. Okay. The Russian version, if you'll notice, has very few Americans in it. <laughs> so they wanted their version that showed it was their thing. Now, when Stanley saw what was going on, he said, you know what? I want our folks to have their own version too. So 
Stanley said, we're going to have our version. So, <laughs> so they took the, these two pictures that you've just seen, you will see nowhere else. They came out of archives full of dust. So that's, uh, <laughs> that was the, the history battle version. Okay. So now what happened through this whole thing was what's the most amazing part. Uh, and that is these men by themselves in this town that nobody knew and that nobody in town understood exactly what the hell they were doing. They learned how to build mutual respect for each other. And these are some pictures of, and, and they, they, they wanted to document things. So these are some pictures, you know, and with all the strange names, uh, Colonel got it. Crack Levenso and Daniel Leven. And so these were different people. And you'll also see here and there a picture of uh, somebody from the, the, uh, the Royal Air Force pops up here and there because they became an integral part of the thing. Now, they did have snafus, like, like everything that goes on in life, nothing is perfect. So the first snafu was that all of the training manuals were written in English and none of the Soviets read English. So, so they had one little problem there. So Gagarin had to stay up night after night and actually translate the thing. And then they had to fly in a typewriter that had German, that had Russian characters from the, uh, the Russian, uh, Council in uh, in Washington D.C., which sent overseas to get one sent in <laughs> they could use. Another little problem was uh, the planes had this big hole. You'll notice down here, and the reason for that was that on the American version of it, we had that teed up so that it tied into radar at different airports in the United States and had coordinates and all that stuff. On the Russian ones, there was no landing coordinates for these planes over in Russia or any anywhere. So uh, leaving them in was confusing everybody. So they just took the damn things out. So they wound up with the hole. We call it the hole in the thing. Now, these are, you know, they're just like, you would think they got together, they would talk about things. This guy was in charge of, uh, of ordinance. This guy here was in charge of production from the Russian end. Uh, this is actually the second. This is gonna be a little bit about, as you would expect, but kind of different. The Soviets were intent on showing they were disciplined. And this is an actual thing that happened they would go and they would mix non-com and officers and people and they would show them a good time at the various clubs around around the uh, around the base and one of the things they all loved was camel cigarettes and part of the reason they loved camel cigarettes was because they all discovered that it had these coupons in them that they can buy other stuff with so they collected all the coupons and gave them to the American quartermaster, who I'll talk about after. And he would go buy liquor for them at the PX down in Norfolk and you know, Norfolk and you know, Norfolk News and all that stuff. So Newport News. So anyway, but one night they drank too much, and one of the Russians set his bed on fire. It was, uh, I think it was, not sure which guy it was. It may have been this one of these guys set the bed on fire. And so they decided that they were so embarrassed that they made him sleep outside in the winter uh, and would not get him a cot before they decided to send him back to Russia. And that decision was made by the guy that you saw in the previous picture that I said you'd get to meet. And his name is Ivan Selenikov. Now, Ivan was their version of the KGB. There's a, pre uh, a, predecessor, a predecessor organization to the KGB. And every 
group that came had their own KBB, KC, uh, KBG agent. So Ivan was there for everything and made every decision on everything that related to people. And by the way, the Americans all knew he was, you know, he was a spy, you know, he was from the spy group. So it was just, that was just the way it was. Now, what happened, uh, I, I mentioned before, I showed you a picture of the second commander. And the reason is because old Victor wasn't around very long. What happened was not more than in the first, by the end of the first cluster of planes, he and another, another fellow took the last two of the first 25 planes. And they were the last to take off. And they went around this place called Engroten, which is over in, uh, in Norway. Unfortunately, it was a very cloudy night and they spotted a ton of U-boats below. So they had to shut their radios off so they couldn't communicate with each other. Neither one realized that that hill was 4,600 feet. And so Victor crashed into it and it was literally days after he told his wife everything was going great. He's looking forward to seeing her again. Now, the interesting part about this is that Victor, the plane, and what they had on the plane was not recovered until 2007. That plane sat up on that hillside in Norway for, what is that, 57 uh, 60 years and you'll see down here it tells you who eventually died who was on it you know they found all the books and records they also found something else in addition to the books and records if you look close down here you'll find something interesting that it says the area was littered with luxury items like american nylon stockings clothes chocolates and cigarettes and so on because what the what the, the Russians quickly figured out was every time a plane went back somewhere, they could load it with stuff that could be sold or give it away to friends and family back over in, on the Russian side. So they would typically load up stuff. But so that's so Victor's bye bye and very early in the mission. So they bring in a second commander, and his name is. Maxime Chebisov. And Chebisov had a wife by the name of Rush, uh, Rulishka and two, two daughters. Uh, the one on the up here, the older one is Amelia, and the one down here is Yulina. And he was very well respected. So unlike, uh, unlike uh, uh, Vasily, this guy was really well respected. He was a hero. And, and so from the first day he got here, he realized he should have diaries. And so he wrote everything that he saw and that happened in diaries that he left for his family. So, so that was kind of, now he was a totally socially curious kind of guy. So his agenda was a little different. All right, you can just tell by the casual smile and everything that he was just a much more approachable person. He really thought it was important to create an understanding between allies. He felt that there was a misunderstanding between Americans and Russians. So he, the second thing is he, he never felt as though he wanted to be overbearing on his men. He wanted them to feel as though they wanted to excel. So he'd always, he's a great motivational guy. Third was he knew that this moment had to be captured for history. So he was absolutely, and he felt from his standpoint as a professional that he wanted the mission to exceed all expectations. So his agenda was much more forward thinking than the other guy. Now, along the way, they decided to start doing some crazy things. So for example, Greg said, all right, we're out in these damn boats so often, you know, and these planes during the day, why don't we kind of turn this into the back end of these planes and create some alfresco dining? So they had 
sandwiches brought out. And so at the end of a work day, they would they would eat in the sun on the back of these on the back of these huge planes. And so that was one of the things they did. There was a guy in Elizabeth City, he's now a little older, a lot older, Alan Gallup, who I met in some of my early days of research. He was like about 10 years old. He said, I remember going out there and watching those soldiers. They they train early in the morning. And he said, and I remember watching them eat and laugh and everything. And so, you know, Alan actually saw that. So I captured a little of that in the book. But the other thing was they were big on training together. So it's almost like Disneyland, you know, with the, uh, the, the plane trainers. So they built these cockpits to simulate what they, you know, would be involved in. And they trained together. You know, and so this was not an absolute replica because you can see there's a gun there and the guns are in the back and all that stuff. But so they wound up yucking it up, but training together, you know, sort of like at Disneyland. The other thing is they'd stop for the occasional beer together during the day. So this handsome looking group of guys were all part of, as you can see, the headquarters they had was this massive building called the Zebra Office. It was kind of off to the side because not a lot of they didn't want a lot of people to know about it, that it, you know, and so it just kind of functioned on its own kind of over there. And so these are these are a bunch of the of, of the players that were involved at the time. Now, um, you know, we get into, you know, the Russians have no sense of humor. Well, this is Captain. His name was Tita. So Captain Tita uh, found this Navy scooter. You know, he used to drive it around the, uh, you know, the, <laughs> the, uh, the runways. And so he said, why don't we turn it into, why don't we have races? And so they wound up uh, whenever they could at the end of various days, they would have American versus Russian races or versus Soviet races on these scooters. And they'd go around the runway. They'd go up one side, around turn around and come back down and they'd have laps and all that sort of like their version of, of, uh, you know, NASCAR. <laughs> the other thing they did was they just, they actually wound up enjoying each other's company a lot. And so this is Chebisaw. There's, uh, Greg, uh, there's a couple of guys that are, uh, this is Sharpkin. Uh, there's, here's our KGB guy. Tarasol, who was the production guy. And so they enjoyed each other's company. And so they would spend time, free time, just relaxing and talking. Now, at, at this point, also, in addition to Chebisol coming on board, they had to find a new way. So the next group of these planes, which was actually the majority, over 100 of them, took a completely different route. They went from a Elizabeth City crossed the United States, went to Great Falls. They would then pick up some British uh, British uh, Air Force and actually a couple of Canadians. They'd take the planes up to Anchorage and then they'd all get out and it would then turn into Russians only and they would take it all the way up to Yakuts in uh, over in uh, in Siberia. So because uh, Stalin would not let Americans cross into Russia. So, but so it was a little, uh, quite a bit longer, a bit more torturous. And uh, one of the stories, which is not in the book, is uh, in, in, they were down in its Texas area and they landed these planes and some guy came up to them, you know, like at one of the local airports and said, what the hell kind of plane do you guys got there? And with those big stars, and and Gagarin said, "Oh, these are we're with the Texas Air Force, and so these are special planes the Texas Air Force." On the guy said, "Fine." So I just they're kind of now they also really learned how to laugh with each other. So in Alaska, Alaska became kind of like a party town for them because it's the sort of like the last time they would be together. And so they, you know, they went out hunting a lot. They all, you know, in those days, everybody loved hunting. And so they would hunt together. 
Another thing they love to do is because railroads were just being built, so they took those uh, those carts, you know, with the giant, uh, uh, you know, uh, iron rail uh, shoes and drive them around, and and they kind of had their own little, you know, their own little. It's a it's a whether it's a great world, uh, the, you know. Anyway, so. Now, what happened was also Chebyshaw, who was a bit of a, a student of history, you know, knew about the uh, the whole Seward Purchase, and and he was troubled by it because he said, "Look at this, you know, there are we're sitting here in in uh, you know Juno and places, and there are these beautiful Russian churches." He said, "I go fishing, I love fresh fishing. There's clean waters." I get all the salmon I want. And so his attitude was, why did we sell Alaska to America? That was, that was one of the questions he used to ask. Why we sell this place? So and now another thing that most people do not realize is the Russians adored Wilbur and Orville Wright. I'm going to show you something here that you've never seen. This is a Russian biography of Wilbur and Orville Wright. It was owned by that world's first female fighter pilot, Lilia Litvak, that I told you about, who studied it. And so the kids from an early age in Russia, when flying started to take off in the, you know, in the 20s and so on, she just, just devoured it. And so all of these Russian kids loved it too. So one of the first things they asked to do on free time was go to Kitty Hawk. And here they are. They went to Kitty Hawk and they were so proud of the fact that they were at the home of Orville and Wilbur Wright that they just spent hours there when they took pictures everywhere. And, you know, you all of you have been at the uh, park, recognize that stone is still there. I took a picture myself by that stone. The monument is still there exactly as it was then. So it was a great, great treat for them. And every one of those 300 people were taken over there at one point or another during their stay. Now, the other thing they learned was American shopping. Now, now first of all, the, the folks in Elizabeth City kind of I had some idea, well, it must be friends of ours. I mean, we're not going to have soldiers that come in here that that aren't friends of America. So, you know, they said, hey, it must be okay. So they started traveling downtown and uh, they, were, they were tying up the buses and whatever cars they could get so much that that these two guys were the two quartermasters, the <laughs> the American quartermaster uh, Captain Sky uh, was was actually Ukrainian, and the Russian quartermaster. And you remember I told you about those camel cigarette things. Well, they somehow took the camel cigarette things and sold those for something else, and then eventually traded that in. You know, rumor has it they sold it for a hundred cases of booze and traded and got a bus, <laughs> and they called it the Zebra Bus Company. And they made a schedule so that everybody could go downtown and shop. <laughs> and so they had shopping trips. This was their favorite department store. It's no longer there, but believe it or not, the sign is still on the wall, Chesson's department store. And they had those big bins, if you remember, uh, you know, where you could, you know, have all the shoes in them. And they, they would come in on payday and they would buy, they would just take the entire bin and take everything. So, the Russians knew, boy, well, the Americans knew, man, when the Russian soldiers were coming at that, they had money in their pocket. And so they got to, over the 18 months, learn <laughs> that uh, make sure, you know, make sure you, your place is stocked when uh, payday comes around. And one of the things they used to buy, these were the old American silver certificates. And the stores, even back then, were no longer taking them. We had transitioned over to American dollars. So, so uh, Gagarin tells them, you know, I tell you what, 
we'll take them off your hands because we know how to use them over here in America. It's not something you'd have to. Gagarin at the time was looking at it as each one of the dollars was worth 250. And so they bought every one of the silver dollars on a one for one basis from the Russians. And as Gregory and in some of the records from Chernak, they made <laughs> nice extra money just on the exchange rate. So that was a little bit about the shopping in Elizabeth City. In fact, I met a woman who's still alive. Um, whose father owned a dry goods store. And uh, she's 105 years old now. And she was saying, I still remember when them boys would come in, man, they'd just pull the bolts off the wall and daddy would say, you let them have whatever they want. And anyway, uh, along the way, they said, you know, we, we need to have a little convenience too. We gotta be able to drive around a little bit. So somehow, you know, I mean, you know, we don't live in this society, but in societies like Russia, they all have workarounds. So they figured out how to get a Chevrolet car over here and use that for like the upper, the upper echelon people. And so there was Maxim Chebyshev. And what he did was he commandeered Anatoly. And so Anatoly's name is Anatoly Volgin. And he got him to be his bodyguard and his driver. <laughs> and so, and the reason was because nobody could read any of these damn signs. They had no idea what the hell they said. So they could not pull into parking spaces right on the wrong stride of the seat. And eventually Gagarin and Chernak had to go over to the police department and vouch for the, for the guys and and made a deal that if you ever run into trouble with them where they don't know what they're doing call us and we'll send somebody over to you know to rescue them so that was that was driving around now the other thing as i mentioned before about chernak and not chernak but chebisol and he wanted his guys to look you know i use the old gillette phrase look sharp feel sharp and there's a reason why i used it because one of the things he felt is that everybody, when they walked around shopping or relaxing in Elizabeth City, should look good. And so, you know, they only knew certain brands. So they would go to this one store and buy every Gillette Blue Blade they could find. The store is a drugstore that still exists to this day. It was started by the name of a guy by the name of John Stevenson. Uh, that's his son, Paul. Paul is now 92. Apparently, Paul decided to marry a 76-year-old woman recently. So, uh, and uh, anyway, I think he's retiring the last time I talked to him. So I got a picture of him in his store. And he said, he remembers, he was about 11. He said, I remember they would come in and they would look for brands. They would look for, you know, razor blades. And he said, French perfume, anything with a French name on they would buy. And the reason was when they had free time, they were wandering around town taking pictures of themselves. So that's so the people started to get to know who these guys were. They'd stop at the ice cream parlors and 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 all that. Now the other thing they loved to do, they discovered something to do on weekends when they had R and R. And in Elizabeth City, right now it's now a senior home, so it's fallen on hard times. There was a deluxe hotel that was opened in the 30s called the Virginia Dare, and it was supposed to be the cat's meow of down this way. And it was quite an attractive, you know, building uh, in its day. That was that was the rendering of the lobby as it was. And this was one of the rooms. And so these guys would come in and think they died and went to heaven. And so every week, every time they had money, They'd come in and load up and stay at the Virginia Bear and go down to the bar. They'd never seen a bar with all that kind of liquor. They'd never seen cocktail lounges like that. <laughs> and that's where many of them spent their weekend. Didn't matter whether you were a uh, an officer or a, a, you know a non-com. You that's where you know. And so that's kind of another thing they did. Now another thing that's kind of interesting is movies. Okay. Um, in Russia at the time, and actually I think almost still to this day, many of the movies are dreadfully 
you know, morose and all that kind of stuff, very heavy. And uh, so this this was a very popular movie at the time. It was, you know, basically saying there's this patriotic guy who's doing things for his country and, you know, and so you ought to die too, you know, and stuff like that. But But they come here and they discover Betty Grable <laughs> and and they discover Lana Turner and they go crazy. And so they're at the Carolina movie theater, which still exists to this day in Elizabeth city. It's closed down. I don't know what they're going to do with it. It's, you know, the, uh, it's still, uh, still got some signage on the front. And so they just went crazy for American movies that had music and girls. <laughs> Uh, now, ironically, nobody knows exactly how this happened, but a famous Russian diva comes to America, to Elizabeth City, to the college of all places, to do a dance spectacular with a balalaika orchestra. And so they do this show. And... The uh, the Americans give them a trip over there. They run stories in the paper. They pay for their tickets, and they all had a jolly old time. And so nobody had never been able to figure out how she wound up in Elizabeth City of all places. Because if you look at it, she was on Broadway and you know in a lot of different places. So anyway, now the other thing that the Russians did was they taught Americans to play chess. One of the, as Greg said to me one day, he said, chess is where we got beat all the time. He said, those guys were always two steps ahead of us when you played chess. So he said, I therefore like them as allies because I knew whatever I wasn't thinking, they were already there. And so they would, they would play chess in the halls and the barracks and the you know, officers clubs everywhere. Now, at the same time, they were confused because they then started to get to understand the newspapers. And at the same time that they were here, the newspapers were saying horrible things about the Russians. And whether you all know it or remember it, depending on your age, Thomas Dewey, his platform against Roosevelt was that I'm the guy that's going to get the red menace out of the government because they are, the communists are all over the place in America. And I'm not going to get into the politics of it, but you've kind of heard some of that all again. So it hasn't changed much. But so they just, Jebisov one day said to uh, Chernak, he said, if somebody writes something like that in Russia, he would get shot. How is, how is it that in America, somebody can write something like that in the papers? So they just, they just didn't understand democracy as we knew it. Now, while all this was going on, they now gotten rid of a whole bunch of planes through, uh, you know, through first you had the group that went over to, through Iceland, you had the second group that went up to Siberia, did very, very well during that. Now there was a call for, Jesus, we need something over in the Pacific region with the Japanese over here. So that led to Route 3 with the remaining planes, which were about, uh, I think, about the last 40 planes. And so this was a really convoluted route. So what they did was they started up here, Elizabeth City. They would come down through South America, to the tip of South America, and Brazil, there the British would take over, and they would take them all the way back through the Sahara Desert and around, you know, and then around here, the Russians would hop on, and they would take the last legs and take planes into Iraq. So that was the third route, much more complicated. Now this one, as I said, the main travel partner, not trainer, but travel partner were 
the Royal Air Force. So they were very instrumental in some of the routing of these planes as, as the mission went on. They get very little credit. But again, they form bonds. These people kept these pictures in their albums and stuff for years and years and years. And this is Captain Fry. I think his first name was Charles. He was the commander of the um, of the Royal Air Force thing. So, so now you got an idea of the humanity that was involved in this thing. So now you know what the planes were, why they came to be, the humanity that was involved in the tra successful training of these people. And now the, the planes go back into war, into warfare. And first thing is that they discover that with all that empty space inside, these things are great troop carriers. So they decide to use some of these things to invade places like Hungary and they fly in at night, very low. And they had like their version of the, so, you know, of our seals would fly in and disrupt whatever it was, a bridge or blow something up and then try to get out of there. <coughs> so they liked the flexibility of the things. In when it, the dust all settled, uh, the 185 nomads ran about 2,000 missions, give or take one, and they never lost the plane. Two went down. One was was uh, was Victor who banged into the mountain, but none were actually lost in battle. And so, you know, this is actually a you know a rendering of of the thing in battle now. There was a second one lost, and some of you may be aware of this, on January 11th, 1945, pretty much the last nomad that was leaving, no, it was later, it was, it was uh, actually the last one left uh, three or four months later, but this particular one left, and it crashed into the Pasatonic River there, uh, not too far from you. Now, what happened was, becomes up for speculation. Okay, because Greg was absolutely certain he knew what happened. And that is the plane would take off, go over the water, past the lighted buoys. And he said, these guys loaded this plane up. It had so much liquor in it that I told them you were gonna bring it, that the plane is, does not have the performance capability to get over over the, the buoys and out into the water. And the, the guy who was in charge at that point said, you know, don't bother me. And they left. And sure enough, as it got over the last buoy, which would have been maybe, oh, a half a mile from the, you know, where they took off, maybe a little, little further, three quarters of a mile, the, the plane, instead of going up, started to lose altitude, could not, could not, right the ship and it went down and five people died because so everybody on board died now here's the trick about it the bodies were never found and so that's one of the last remaining zebra missions and it's going to come back we'll talk about that in a second here because it comes back in a surprising way what i'm going to show you now is something pretty unusual may 45 we know is v-day same with the Russians. You will not see this picture anywhere else, I do not believe. This is, well, first of all, this part you will. This is the, you know, the, uh, the sort of, uh, you know, accolades and, and tiled gifts and, uh, you know, all those kind of toast to the World War, you know, respect the presentations for World War II in, in Moscow. But this is Elizabeth City. As far as I know, it's the only time you will find a bunch of Russians raising an American flag in Elizabeth City. And that was the then mayor, Joe, I forget Joe's last name at the time. But so they were kind of, you know, saying their goodbyes and toasting us at the same time. Now, speaking of goodbyes, it was now time to say goodbye. And so those people you saw before, Whoever was left that hadn't 
and you know was in the last group there they were again there's the big planes getting ready to go some of them were leaving from uh you know from up in alaska and so everybody was was providing their last now the americans decided to do something a little different uh it was heavily at uh chernak's request but he said why don't we give Chebiso a going away gift. So they went and bought one of those engraved silver cases and they all signed it. So those are the people that were involved in the mission. And that was the case that Chernak decided that that Greg Gagarin should give them because they had developed such a close, close connection. That case today exists over in a little World War II museum in Moscow. When he received the case and they went up to Alaska and said their final goodbyes, Chebyshev took his wings off, which is a great statement in, in, in Russian culture, took his wings off and gave them to Gagarin and said, uh, I would like you to never forget me because I will never forget this moment. And so they exchange gifts and that medal still exists. It, it may be down in the museum now in Elizabeth City. Last time it was in Greg's house and his son was deciding what to do with it. But so those were the going away gifts. Now, now I'm gonna show you just how perverted everything becomes. Now, this is, this is uh, Colonel uh, Tuyoza, Tuyoza is his name. And Tuyoza was in charge of making sure these planes got delivered on time with the right stuff and all that. And so he sent the letter at the end that he wanted to be registered for history. And, and it's kind of a, there's a kind of a, uh, a, a line in here which you may not be able to see but it's it's kind of kind of funny it says our pilots were pleased with their performance meaning the nomads stamina and sturdiness in combat although they have occasionally been shot up a little they always return we know that these good qualities of sturdiness and performance are in large measure the result of your careful supervision of their production. So it just, and you know, and he just went on to say, you know, he thanks everybody from the bottom of their heart. So it's kind of like, it was his, his little swan song. Now, this is Maxime Chebyshev, as I mentioned before, um, they never wound up with driver's licenses. So they used their U.S. Navy license to uh, drive around with, so that 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 is Maxim's license. And he wrote a final letter to Patrick Bellinger, and I thought, kind of, you know, um, the last the last paragraph is something that I mean struck me, and oh, it continues to strike me. I shall take the greatest pleasure in telling the people of my country about the warm and friendly reception accorded to me and my officers during our stay in one of your bases under your jurisdiction. The deep feeling of esteem and appreciation for you will remain with us forever. And that was signed by, by Maxime. So Bellinger also was touched by the whole thing. And so he sent his own letter back across and, and basically he just says, you know, I feel that the spirit of cooperation that they are two, not two great countries has grown from such contacts and continue the mutual benefit of each. So he, he never forgot. All the families will tell you they never forgot, you know, this, this thing. Now, because of this, Bellinger decided to recommend the Americans, the 12 guys that participated for Medals of Honor. These were the documents with the recommendations. These we found in Chernak's uh, basement. And there was one story that ran one time. And you'll see down the bottom, it's, uh, they call it 
It was FDR's pet project and it never ran again. There was never any additional pickup. That was it. So then Roosevelt dies. So Truman has a completely different take on Stalin. He hates him. And one of the things that most people don't know was one of the reasons why uh, Truman hated Stalin so much is that um, Roosevelt used to tell Truman that uh, Stalin's like an Uncle Joe, if you know how to treat him. And that just pissed off the guy from Kansas tremendously. So anyway, uh, so he just hated him. And then of course came along Senator McCarthy with his witch hunt. So Truman had everything that could possibly be related to this thing buried. He didn't want anybody to ever see anything again. And that's the way it remained until this is the declassification thing. That's the way it remained till December 31st, 2012. So now, now here's you're going to see a tale of two cities. Chernak was totally disillusioned by what happened after the fact, okay? And he remembers this, and he remembered on you the, that the, the recommendations for the medals were just dished, tossed in the, in the garbage pail, never happened. And so at the same time, he knew that in Russia, it was a completely different thing. Maxime got a book about heroes and and uh, the zebras would meet periodically and they'd have their own club and they were sort of like this club and people knew about it. Uh, they would from time to time flash pictures. This was when they when they were in at one point in Iran. And so from a zebra standpoint, everything uh, from a Russian standpoint, and Maxime eventually became, you know, a, a super ranking, you know, officer, well decorated, and and all that kind of stuff. So he became pretty famous as a great warrior. And in the back of again another little museum in Russia sits much of the memorabilia he collected from Project Zebra, and it still sits there to this day. So. And Gagarin got lots of accolades too, except it wasn't in America. It was in Russia. He went back and was accorded when he went back to visit Heroes Welcome. I mean, he was on the front cover of, of the newspaper. They gave him awards. And he also went to see Maxime's family. And so these are the two daughters you remember. Uh, and so he spent time with them and the grandchildren and stuff like that. So he was kind of like, now, 1990, about 1991, Maxim finally passes, give or take a little bit. And so he finds out that uh, they put a bust of him in the Hall of Heroes. So he goes and says his final goodbyes. And that was probably the last time Gregory was in, was in, uh, Russia. So, and to this day, Maxim Chebisov bust remains a prominent place in the Hall of Heroes. Now, somewhere later, uh, Greg had stayed in touch with Emilia and Yulina, and so they very much wanted to visit Elizabeth City because they had heard so much from their father over the years. And so there they are. They did, in fact, come to Elizabeth City. They got to see the little town. They got to see the base. They got to see everything that their father talked about. So they were very, very happy. And so that's, that's them in Elizabeth City. Uh, there's kind of a couple of little sidebars to this story that are sort of entertaining. I told you there's 185 nomads. There was actually 186. <laughs> The 186, nobody seems to know whether it was just a production mistake or whatever, but this giant plane sat across from the Coast Guard base for some 20 years. 
grading vines and so on like that. And there's a guy by the name of Ed Fearing, whose family is fairly famous in Elizabeth City. And Ed said, oh, man, I remember that plane. We used to get in there, and we'd do war games and everything. And the guns were gone, but the turrets were still there. And sometimes I'd you know, get into the landing, the bomb bays, and make like I was a bomb. And, and, so, and so I said, well, what happened to the plane? And he says, I don't know. You have to ask Charles Gordon. One day it was gone. So I said, who the hell is Charles Gordon? And he says, Charles Gordon owns a sheetrock, a sheet metal company. I said, all right. So I go to see Charles. Charles is today is probably 95. This was him about two years ago, a year ago. By the way, there's the Virginia Dare Hotel in the background I was talking about before. So anyway, Charles, yeah, he brings out this guy, Mike. And they explain that, yeah, some guy called him one day. 10, 15 years ago and said, we'd like to come and buy that plane and take it away. And so can you go to the Cowscott base and find out, you know, how much it would cost? And so Charles goes over and the, and the Coast Guard base says, they want to take it. There's no cost. Just get it the hell out of here. It's got snakes in it and it's a nightmare. So he called them back and these guys came down with a, with a 18 wheel truck, dismantled it, put it on the giant truck and drove away and gave Charles a bag of money. Charles didn't have a receipt because it was it was a cash transaction, as he called it. <laughs> and he's too old to remember exactly how much it was. But Mike says, hey, I made some pretty good money on that. And so that was plane number 186. And so it's kind of like, OK, uh, you know, the, we're done now. There's there's the book. There's the collaboration. I worked with Greg on it and his family. It was and you know, all the people I told you about, the people in Russia, it was a incredible experience uh, for me. And meeting the Chernak family and you know the, uh, the Chebisov family and so on. So and yeah, it all happened in Elizabeth City, right down the road from you guys. So the way I closed in the book was the way I thought these men would like to do it. And that was, thank you, America. We don't know when, we don't know where, but we'll meet you again some sunny day. And I thought the Russians, the Americans would have the same sentiment for the Russians. Now, what I do, and I don't mean to, to make to make this sound commercial, but what I do is I do a lot of promotional videos with my books. And this book is just, you know, sold like crazy. So. I thought the 60 or 70 seconds, you might like to see how we encapsulate everything I just told you in a little promotional video. So here it is. Well, uh, typically, you would say we're kind of done at this stage, and in some ways we are, but I thought you might be interested because I 
get asked all the time, what ever happened after all that? And best way to explain it is uh, Yogi Berra. It ain't over unless it's over. And uh, here's what happened. About two years ago, uh, one of those five people that died, his name was Vladimir Levin. Um, two guys came to Elizabeth City. James Cannell, who might be in the audience right now, I'm not totally sure, and Maxim uh, Alex Alexin, and. Uh, he is the colonel who was in charge of, uh, you know, the Russian side commission on POWs and MIAs. And they came to the city and said, you know, we would like to bring closure to the whole tragedy for Russian families. So, and we would also like to offer Elizabeth City an unusual gift. And now to understand the gift, you need to understand this picture. This at the entrance to Moscow is their Victory Day Memorial. And that is a French soldier, an English, a Russian, and an American uh, toasting the fact that they worked together to win World War II. And so the gift was this. It was a giant bronze monument, not dissimilar from what you just saw, which would have an American, a Russian, and a British soldier. And so that was the memorial that was proposed. And what happened is it got turned down twice. So uh, for reasons that I almost don't even want to get into, they're so sad, but uh, it was turned down twice by the city, despite very, very strong proposal uh, from, from uh, you know, Joe Peel, who was then the mayor and, and a bunch of us, any event. So that seems to be dead. Uh, but I learned something else out of all this. And I guess now after three books about and around Russians, even though I have no Russian background whatsoever, I thought you might get a kick out of this. This is, this guy here is Sergei. I'm not going to tell you Sergei's last name. He's a retired KGB guy. On one of my trips to Moscow, we wound up at the Kremlin and he decided that he would give me his take on communism. Well, he says that the uh, seven wonders of communism are that uh, that uh, despite despite uh, everybody, uh, you know, doesn't have enough food, uh, everybody, nobody's complaining. Besides, nobody's complaining. Uh, everybody's finding a way. Despite everybody's finding a way, everybody's stealing. Despite everybody's stealing, nobody's going to jail despite everybody is dealing and nobody's going to jail and he just goes on and on about the, and it's absolutely hysterical so i'm sorry you guys can't hear it it's just funny that you know where you can find it it's over on my website so but anyway so um that's kind of the story of of project zebra um I don't know if there are questions or how you want to operate from here. Sure, there are certainly a heck of a lot of questions, so I hope you're ready for an extended period of Q&A. <laughs> sure, I just have to, if you don't mind, I just got to call the CIA, uh, FBI are at the front door. I have to <laughs> ask them to come back tomorrow. They don't seem to mind. That's actually uh, my first question, which is, uh, given your preoccupation <laughs> with Russian and American relations, um, have you ever had uh, had to deal with the FBI? Yeah, uh, what happened was uh, about three years ago, after call sign White Lily and seven days in Russia, uh, my son was home by himself and two FBI agents came to the door with their guns and and business cards and <laughs> said, father, I've done anything wrong. We just want to talk to him. <laughs> and so they then came to our house every three months without fail for the next uh, two years. And they always wanted to know what I was doing there. Who did I see? Where was I going? And, and so 
it was literally we were giving them a tour and then i think somewhere at the two and a half year mark they announced god you're really doing some unusual things we don't know of any other american so so here's a here's a pen with a bunch of diamonds and stuff in it no it doesn't have any <laughs> it doesn't have any uh you know uh recording devices and here's a defense attache medal you know for your uh your for your work <laughs> and that was it they haven't been back since so what you've provided us tonight was a, a great social history and a, a look at the, um, you know, the lives the trainees experienced while they were in Elizabeth City. Um, how did you initially kind of roll into this story? I know you spoke briefly about it towards the beginning uh, that you were kind of introduced to yeah. this. Uh, to this. Yeah, what, what happened was uh, in, in longer form, after I had finished the first two books uh, and I had spoken, I had been a guest speaker. Uh, by then, I had spoken at the uh, American Center for Democracy in Moscow, the European, I mean, the uh, Russian consulate, uh, in, a, in a few other places. And I wound up back in Washington, and I was speaking at the uh, uh, the Russian Cultural Center. And this guy came up to me and said, you know, my name is Greg Gagarin, and I've seen what you've been writing, and I've never seen an American be able to do some of that with that kind of accuracy. The way you describe what happened in, in the 1920s and 30s with that girl is exactly the way it was there. And I, I said, well, I collaborated with, you know, some very nice Russian people who worked with me and so on and so forth. And I said, it took us two and a half years. And so he said, that's when he said, I think I have a story that you might like. And the problem was he was now 93 and it was all kind of garbled, you know, and I couldn't quite get what the hell he was talking about. Um, so we, we sat together once and I still didn't quite get it. And then I sat down, had tea with his wife, who was, was a, was a kid at 91. And so, Anne started to explain what went on. And then I realized more and more. And so, we go over his house and there's cabinets full of this Chebisov's metal. And I was talking about the silver certificates. There's all this stuff. And I said, well, it's certainly an interesting story. And he says, well, you, uh, you also need to, uh, he, said, he said, he also, he said, you need to, um, uh, you need to meet Maxim's family. And I said, what are you talking about? And he says, I want you to go to Russia. I said, great, this is going to do. So I went back to Russia again and I met with Maxime's family. And now I'm starting to get what's going on. And so I'm developing these pieces. And one day I said, God, if I could ever figure out how to get a hold of Chebiso, uh, of uh, somebody from Chernak's family, we'd really have a, and that's what I tried to do. And so anyway, the bottom line was somebody just told me I should go to the first slide or something to make it better than what we are. And uh, so anyway, he, uh, I, I wound up at, uh, at the house of Rebecca Chernak. <laughs> and I now had all these incredible pieces and I was able to put the story together. And what I did was with Greg, I would write chapter at one chapter at a time, I would go over it with him. His eyesight was failing. And by the time we got to chapter 20, he was blind. And I would read the chapters to him. And his wife would sit there and help us edit and addition or change. And we'd pull out stuff out of the files. And we went through his desks and everything. And it was a labor of love, but we slowly put it all together. And I was so proud when we had the book done and when it came out of production, was getting ready to get published and so on. I got some books together for the family and I was all excited about bringing it to, to Greg. And by then he was totally, you know, he was totally blind. So we never actually saw the final product. And one of the last things he said to me the day before he died, he called me when I was in the car and he just said, I wanted to tell you, 
you know, I'm, 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 I'm dying. I won't be here probably tomorrow or the day after. So I just wanted to let you know that it was a great joy working to you, with you on this. And it's something my family will now have forever. And so I appreciate that. That's certainly very moving. Uh, you can advance or retreat the slides as as you would like to to create a more pleasing uh, still image yeah, if you'd I'm like. Get, I'm just trying to go back to the front for you guys, so it's instead of I'm just trying to figure out how to get back to the first slide. <laughs> or, or perhaps leave it there on the monument one, as uh, there are a number okay. of questions I think about that. Sure. There we go. Um, there, the declassification was relatively recently uh, in, in just 2012, right? Um, yeah. Was that kind of led through your work? Were you able to file a Freedom of Information Act request or had some other force allowed that to be declassified? Uh, I think it was total coincidence. I'd love to say it was because of my work, but I think it was it was just a complete coincidence. And, and, and whoever, you know, however it was released, they had no idea about all the stuff surrounding it so it was it just you know it added a little extra um and it actually what it did more than anything else was the various documents i had it sort of placed them in the puzzle in the proper way allowing you probably to, to see the bigger picture yeah. um you've got quite a lot of our uh, airplane aficionados worked up uh on the uh, question and answer period here. Um, do you have any more information about where aircraft number 186 ended up? No, all, all, all Charles remembers is that it was taken apart, put on the plane, I uh, put on the train, and we originally tried to trace it to California, but since he didn't keep any records because he didn't want to pay any taxes on the deal, we never really got who it was. I, I got somewhere, some company, but they no longer existed. And so I eventually just gave up because I have no idea. Uh, you know, the, the dream was we were going to find it and somebody was going to renovate it and reconstruct it. It was going to wind up somewhere. And well, no. we know a few folks around here who do stuff like that, and I think that's uh, probably the tree that was being barked up. So yeah, yeah. Uh, a project to be sure is to to continue the search for, for number 186. Um, are you aware of any nomads in, in museums, perhaps in Russia? No, no, I have not. Um, now, I have not been to the Hall of Heroes, but I was in a strange place where they keep old aircraft outside of Moscow, and it has planes going back to literally the early days, but there was nothing in there in there like that. You know, they were they were adapted P-39s. There was even Sputnik and, and some other stuff laying around in it. And I mean literally laying around and and uh, but no, I couldn't I couldn't find a, a nomad. It's, it's certainly an, an interesting caper. I'm sure we have folks already searching. Um, Matt, did you encounter struggles relative to the language barrier in your research? Uh, yeah, I mean, what I've done is um, I, I speak very few words, you know, like Skolpa, Menyezavut, Matt Krishi, you know, Das Vidanya. So what I've found is by and large, I stumbled along, but I got very fortunate because I had Greg who spoke absolutely fluently. So he was always able to bridge things for me. And then, you know, like when I met with Maxime's, Maxime's family, the father uh, or the, the son-in-law, Arthur Rubin, he married, uh, he married uh, Yelena. Yolina doesn't speak English, but Arthur spoke a little English. And and so they, in fact, even said they'd love to help us do an extended volume of the thing. But then I think with our relationship with Russia, everybody that was going to get involved in anything is just kind of taking a backseat, you know, and said, nah, I don't want to get in any more trouble. 
Although, I'm going to read you something which is kind of interesting. This came in yesterday because I have a mail list. What I like to do is uh, once a month we send out something in the mail to everybody and we have a little bit of fun with it. But um, this is from a, a PhD that I met along the way over in Russia. His name is Serge Ag. Ag, Ag Fanzik, Afanazik, something like that, Fanazev. And he wrote me, Dear Matt, thank you for your invitation because you're on the mail list to discuss your important book. This is just literally yesterday, Project, your important book, Project Zebra, about the fruitful wartime cooperation between Russia and the United States. Uh, I will not be able to attend this time but with high regards and greetings from Moscow, rainy Moscow, waiting for those 24 little hours that bring sun and flowers. Thank you for bringing this, mem this wonderful memory of, of this fine time. So I read that only because what I've learned probably more than anything else out of all this cross-cultural stuff, because I'm a kid from New York, I mean, to me, everything, there was New York and every place else. So, and I didn't, never did anything for anybody and, and all that. Uh, but one of the things this has taught me is looking back at things and what they were trying to say in a broad scheme of things, you know, I don't want to sound, I don't want to sound like I'm now like this confirmed, you know, Russia, Russia, whatever you want to call it, phobia, you know, uh, you know, advocate, but the, it, this all came unglued with Russia. Forgetting about Stalin, there's nothing you can do about Stalin. He's like Hitler is an aberration, all right? But after that, uh, they never forgot the fact that they lost 41 million people, of which, by the way, only six were Stalin killing. The rest were killed by others that that um, they never forgot the fact that they never got one thank you from America. And for their efforts, they got kicked out of NATO and they've been disrespected over the years. And so it's some measure of anger and disillusionment and whatever that all adds into, you know, their, 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 their spy thing and all that stuff. And, you know, we, we position them as, you know, what they are. So I, I've learned it's just interesting. Uh, and I, I don't want to overstate, you know, that we're best friends or anything like that. But it's, it's sort of interesting. And you know, our line is usually, well, the people are okay, it's just the government. And no, it's not. Uh, not everybody in the government is sitting in their closet trying to send pieces of mail to disrupt the American election. So I, I, I don't buy that. So <laughs> That doesn't mean there aren't people doing stuff. Somebody just hacked into my own emails. <laughs> but anyway, enough on all that. But <laughs> just rejoining the, the the story here, how long was the training course for each class of, of Russian airmen? Yeah, it, it, it was a good um, 45 to 90 days because they also made sure they knew something about training about repairs uh because it wasn't like you know they were going to pull into an aaa and get the things fixed if they malfunction and and they would send people over and some would stay in russia and some would come back so they had a comp a blend of you know those coming back over uh and so so i would say that typically a cycle was 40, let's say 45 to 60 days. Okay. Um, as a follow-up to the training question, were they training folks to return to Russia and operate the airplanes directly, or were they intended to go back to Russia and perhaps train more air crews themselves? Both. Both. The idea was, because when the dust all settled, if each plane, uh, 185 planes, they, they held crews of 11, so they needed uh, 1,800 people to fly all that stuff that they brought over. So some of them stayed to train other people, and some of them came back to pick up whatever 
other stuff, you know, and then go back. And so that that went on. And, and what was going on was as people came back, some of the more fluent people would come back. So they, the language barriers would become less intense. So another interesting question, naturally the uh, the Soviets weren't the only nation that had airmen here in the United States training. Um, right. The British trained uh, in places like Terrell, Texas. Um, but it is interesting that at all of those bases, those airplanes were operated with American national insignia on them. Uh, it's right. pretty rare to have anything with a you know foreign insignia training at an American base during the war. Right. Was that especially noteworthy to the people in Elizabeth City? Um, it was noteworthy to any anybody that was dealing with air control, traffic air control, because when they uh, one of the ways that uh, Greg met his wife, Anne, was up in uh, fancy girls school up in Lake Champlain. And he used to take seven, eight Russians with him so they could get to meet some girls. And they would fly up over New York airspace, East Coast airspace. And as soon as somebody, you know, would, would say, you know, who are you guys, where are the guys in the plane with the red stars, they just shut it off and not talk to them anymore. So it was very unusual <laughs> and uh you know but uh they work their way around it i guess that, that life finds a way uh, to quote jurassic park but um have you been you've obviously visited elizabeth city have you been able yeah. to go on base there and uh, see oh, yeah, how much there. of the historic facility yeah. remains yeah yeah i've been there a number of times so i've been I mean, I've spoken at the museum there. I've been a guest down in the city. I've been, you know, a keynote speaker and some stuff around town. So I've, I've sort of done Elizabeth City fairly extensively, shaken the tree on, you know, Joe Peel was great, the former mayor. We we found everybody that that would seem to still be living that might remember Elizabeth City. I, I might rem See, because Joe was thinking it would be a great tourist attraction, you know, that we'd be able to put this thing up as a tourist attraction and it would tie, you've got Kitty Hawk for, you know, over Wilbur Wright, you could come over and see a piece of, of history that's very unusual. Uh, and, um, you know, but, but city council said no. I know that's a, that it's been a complex undertaking because I know that our, our leadership team here at the museum has been watching it eagerly. Uh, it's a story that obviously we share with people when they visit and, and see our PBY here. Um, but hopefully, hopefully it will find resolution eventually. Uh, things have a way of working out. Um, do you have any information about whether or not the training of these Russian airmen interfered with the routine base operations at Elizabeth no, City because they no, were hunting they didn't Because what they did was they literally cordoned them off. It's no longer set up that way. But when you go on the Coast Guard base today and you go through the main gate, which is now a, you know, kind of like a guardhouse, over to the left is a big empty field. And that's where the barracks were for the uh, the, the whole Project Zebra thing. So, you know, if you went to the right, you went towards the, sort of the mainstream base. So they were all in the barracks off to the left and the landing field was kind of like straight ahead. So imagine a triangular space. You you came into the base at the head of the triangle to the uh, to one leg of the triangle is where the barracks were the uh, uh, the landing takeoff area was kind of at a, uh, I would say a 90 to 120 degree angle to the main entrance. And then you had all the regular troops over to the right. Okay, and uh, just wrapping up here, we've got a couple last questions. You uh, went into some detail about the the complex ferry operations to return aircraft uh, to the Soviet Union. Yeah. Obviously, the, the the routes taken and the experience of ferrying those airplanes could be its own presentation. Uh, yeah. Where did we get the Russians from? Uh, how did they get here to the United States? Oh, we flew them in. Uh, they, they came, we, we, we flew them in through points from overseas in Europe 
and they landed and they landed in Washington uh, and then flew from Washington into Elizabeth City. Our last question is, did they just receive familiarization with the airplane uh, and the mechanical training, or was there a component of the training that was specifically about how to hunt submarines? No, there was there was uh, no training about how to, how to hunt the submarines, because in fact, they probably knew more about it than our Navy people did. All right, Matt. Well, that wraps up our question and answer period for this evening. Thank you again so much for for the research that you've done, for the the way you've crafted it into a very readable narrative that we can all enjoy. Uh, and, and thank you for your time this evening. That was great fun. Really enjoyed it. Thank you all so much and uh, yeah. have a great evening. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thanks again.